Hello and welcome to a new series for 2023. It's good to be back with you all. As you will know from my bulletins, the film I made uh, about the Northumberland coast in 2020 was, which was really the starting point for this, uh, the concept of this channel, was only ever intended as a tourist guide for a friend and never intended as a serious documentary. So I wanted to redress that and look at the Northumberland coast with a more discerning eye. We will visit some of the places we have seen in the previous films and examine those more closely. But we will see other places that didn't get a mention in the 2020 films. Before we embark on the journey up the coast, I wanted to take a moment to talk about Northumberland as a whole. The county has changed shape and size many times over the centuries. The word Northumberland means land north of the Humber, as named by the Anglo-Saxons. Northumberland was formerly known as Northumbria, which similarly translates as the province north of the Humber. Northumberland has a very rich prehistory going back to the early origins of man uh, and many remarkable artefacts have been found over the years. It hosts early cave art stone circles and prehistoric settlements in abundance. The area has always been a frontier zone with the varying populations that have lived to the north and the south of it. To the north of the region it was populated by the Celtic Britons and to the south of the region it was populated by the Brigantes. The Celts came from a wide area of Indo-European peoples stretching from modern-day France and Spain in the west and all the way east to Turkey. In case you're curious as to what corded ware culture shown in this diagram means, it was simply the name given to the European tribes who made ribbed earthenware pots and lived in this northern half of Europe around 3,000 years BC. The Brigantes also have Celtic origins and the name means high up. These people occupied the high grounds of the Pennines and North Yorkshire, so the name possibly referred to their settlements being on higher ground. However, in Welsh, Brigantes means privileged or elevated, as with the goddess Brigantia of ancient Greece, maybe suggesting a higher nobility. No one is certain.
Northumberland didn't even exist before the coming of the Anglo-Saxons. The Romans simply referred to it as Britannica Inferior and largely gave regional names to the areas based on the names of the indigenous tribes who lived there. During the Roman occupation, most of Northumberland lay to the north of Hadrian's Wall and was only briefly under the control of Rome when the empire extended north to the Antonine Wall. That only lasted 80 years between 142 AD and 222 AD. The period following the Roman occupation is the period where there is least written records of events and historians all have varying views on what happened next. Films and fiction use this period of uncertainty to romanticise about the existence of King Arthur, Camelot and Merlin in a unified Britain. However, the history books tell a different story. The written accounts suggest that the Anglo-Saxons invaded Britain after the Romans left. However, it is more accurate to say that because the Roman evacuation left the north vulnerable to attack from the tribes in Scotland, the Anglo-Saxons were largely invited to come and occupy Northern Britain. They were given large swathes of land in the north to help defend the unprotected lands in the north and the east. It was King Ida, the Anglo-Saxon leader, and his six sons who began the formation of what was to become Northumbria. They established the Kingdom of Bernicia, as it was known in Latin, or Brinic in the Celtic language, here at Bamborough, around 547 AD, and occupied the area to the east of the coast, as far as the Cheviot Hills. In 593 AD, Ida's grandson, Ethelfrith, became King of Bernicia, which had expanded to cover an area from the Firth of Forth in the north to the Tees in the south. During his reign, he claimed Deira to the south of his kingdom and united the areas, calling it Northumbria. The kingdom he ruled in today's terms would stretch north to south from Edinburgh to Hull and west to east from Carlisle to Newcastle. That survived just short of 400 years until 927 AD when the Kingdom of Northumbria ceased to exist and was reduced to an earldom, so declared by Ethelstan, the first King of United England. And you will recall that character in um, the series Last Kingdom. He was the grandson of King Alfred and the son of King Edward, who first appeared in series three as a child and then appeared throughout series five as a young adult. In 954 AD, the Scottish King Indulf took back Edinburgh. Then in 1018, the area between the Tweed and the Forth, known as Lothian today, was taken by Malcolm II after he slaughtered the English at the Battle of Carron. That area has remained Scottish to this day, with the exception of Berwickshire. That left the area between the Tweed and the Humber still calling itself Northumberland. After the invasion of Britain by William the Conqueror, he ordered a survey of the land in 1085 to assess the value of the land and who owned what. This is known today as the Doomsday Book. 
Everything north of the Humber River was ignored. Such was the insignificance of the area at that time. In 1237, King Henry III of England and Alexander II of Scotland signed the Treaty of York and agreed the Anglo-Scottish border, which has remained largely unchanged to this day. The Treaty of York resulted in North Yorkshire being annexed from Northumbria and becoming a separate region of its own. Yorkshire had pretty much become a separate region after Northumbria was reduced to an earldom by King Ethelstan. The Danes who occupied the area we know today as the East Midlands absorbed Yorkshire into their lands but showed no interest in Northumberland or Durham. In 1614, a bill was passed through Parliament which gave Durham its independence from Northumberland also. From as early as 1018 AD, it had been controlled by the bishops of Durham anyway, the reason it is often referred to as the land of the Prince Bishops. That left Northumberland as the area between the River Tyne and the Tweed. That remained so until the 1st of April 1974, when the powers that be declared that the boroughs north of the River Tyne became North Tyneside, and those areas uh, between Newcastle and Sunderland became South Tyneside and Tyne and Weir. So Northumberland today is only a fraction of what it once was. Now the fifth largest county in England behind Yorkshire, Lincoln, Devon and Norfolk. It covers an area of 1,165,000 acres. It has everything from mountains, moorlands, meadows and national parks to a stunning coastline and an area of outstanding unspoilt beauty.
And finally, as I always say, um, if you've enjoyed this, please give it a like switch on the notifications and please subscribe if you haven't already done so. Um, that way you're informed of all the latest releases as soon as they are posted. So it's goodbye for now and I will see you all in the next episode very soon.